hazard, prices, insurance, and consumer behavior, private financing and private delivery, physician behavior and reimbursement, technological change and the increasing cost of healthcare, and health versus healthcare. Okay, those are the topics we covered in the lectures uh, back in December, and those are the sessions I want to remind you about today as we uh, review. Okay, so let's start with financing healthcare. And if you remember back, the key issues that we talked about were mandates versus public provision, models of public health care financing, and equity and health care financing and use. And we, begun, uh, we began our discussion with goals of the health care system, and we had a couple of different sets of goals. I only put up one in this review session just to trigger your memory as to what kinds of goals uh, different organizations might put out there as useful for um, thinking about a healthcare system, and these are the ones from the WHO, the World Health Organization, and they had three main goals, which I think were themes that came up throughout the course, achieving good health, responding to expectations of the population, and fairness of financial contributions. And within those categories, uh, importantly, they included two subcategories for most of them, the third one more naturally lends itself to one, which is thinking about overall health, measured uh, as an average or in some other way, but also thinking about the distribution, right? So it's not uh, the average that only matters, but also how is the bottom doing relative to the top, how is the top doing, and everybody in between. Same with responding to expectations of the population. We want to uh, get some sense overall of how the system performs, but we also want to think about how the system might perform for those at different parts of the income distribution, let's say. And then, of course, fairness of financial contribution that directly touches on um, issues of distribution and equity, equality, and so, and so naturally that's what it's going to focus on. And uh, we move to also thinking about, welcome, uh, Kirsten has just joined, uh, evaluating performance of the healthcare system. And again, when you think about the performance of the system, we had a couple of different examples, and those examples uh, included WHO example, which I have here for uh, review, um, thinking about mortality or morbidity, thinking about access, choice, and wait times, uh, the distribution or equality within those, and then the ex post progressivity or proportionality of payment, and achieving, uh, achieving outcomes but relative to the resources that you put in, so some measure, measure of efficiency as well. I will remind those on the call that if you wish to stop uh, me at a point and just ask a question, uh, I am very happy to take questions even though we are not in the same room, and you can do that uh, by chat, or if you have a microphone, you can just ask the question, it should be enabled. Okay? Uh, we moved on from there to functions of the healthcare system, and this was a setup for some of the stuff we talked about in more detail later on. We talked about what the system has to do, and we brought, broke it down into four main uh, categories. It had to raise revenues. It has to pool risk, and we'll come back to that when we review adverse selection in a few minutes. It has to uh, find a way to purchase services, and that necessarily means as they purchase, they have to pay providers, hospitals, doctors, nurses, and everybody else in the system, and they have to figure out what the system is going to cover. Right? What kinds of services? Who is it going to cover? Uh, how much of these various services? These are all decisions that come into the four functions of healthcare financing that systems have to decide on. And we had a couple of notes about these systems. One was that we uh, need to consider that these functions can really be independent of one another. Right? You don't have to, if you make one choice for raising revenue, and that's often um, either a choice around tax financing or maybe social insurance, that does not necessarily dictate how you have to run the other uh, three functions of the system, uh, and same with pooling risk, and, and same with purchasing services. You can mix and match within a system, and even if there are similarities across some systems that suggest that some of these go together, that's more about historical accident than uh, hard constraint, that in fact you can mix and match a little bit more, okay? Um, the other point we made was that uh, one should try to keep in mind uh, the difference between goals and functions to actually figure out what we are measuring against. 
right? The goal might be achieving good health, uh, and the function uh, might be all of these four that go into achieving good health. So goals and functions are separate, okay? We thought a bit about models for public coverage, and we laid out four broad models for public coverage, uh, and I list them here again for you. Uh, the first was broad public coverage with uh, a parallel um, private system, right? So you have many, many things covered publicly, uh, and you can have a parallel system that covers some things privately that are also covered publicly. We had a co-payment structure, and we thought about France, and there's other examples, obviously, of this as well, where you have public coverage, broad public coverage, but at the same time, you require people to pay uh, part uh, of the care, and then you can think about whether there are models to ensure part of those uh, co-payments or not. We thought of a group-based system, and certainly part of the U.S. would be an example of this, where certain groups uh, fall into um, certain kinds of coverage, and so, uh, for example, if you are over 65 in the United States, you are eligible for public coverage under Medicare, but if you're not, you don't get that coverage. Uh, and a sectoral system, and Canada was the example we used there, where we have broad public coverage for certain types of services um, and no public or limited public coverage for other types of services. And so we had uh, the example in Canada would be very broad public coverage without really any co-payments for hospital and doctor services, but no public coverage um, in general, although specific populations may have it, uh, for pharmaceuticals or dental or other uh, parts of the system that might be required. Okay, so I use these four examples, uh, country, example countries for these four different systems, but remember that many systems uh, have more than one of these systems in play, more than one of these models in play, and so you might say, well, I think the U.S. is more of a different kind of system. That is fine. It does have a number going on. There's obviously some co-payments going on. Uh, there's obviously some elements of uh, public coverage and parallel private coverage, but also it's a good example of, the, of a group system. Okay, so all of those uh, are going on. Okay, so uh, still on financing in the first lecture, we, we thought a little bit about how uh, can, you know, what decisions does the system have to make if it wants to provide universal health coverage? It has to figure out how to extract tax payments from households and uh, how it can provide that. So what can the government do? It has options. It can extract the payments and provide coverage directly. Many countries do that. It can mandate that employers provide the benefits, or so it can pass uh, legislation that says employers must do this, uh, and Germany has a bit of this, and the U.S. has, has, has moving to this uh, in part. And it can also mandate that individuals obtain benefits directly, uh, where uh, the government would, would legislate that individuals have to obtain coverage. If they get it through their employer, great. If they're eligible for public coverage, great. If not, they have to do it privately in some way. All right, so it has all of these options. And on the uh, public side, the public collection side, uh, it has some options too. We talked a little bit about all of these. Uh, direct taxes levied on individuals um, and corporations. So we talked about income taxes, business taxes, property taxes. Indirect taxes, such as uh, VATs, uh, basically VATs and sales taxes are the big indirect taxes. And then social insurance contributions, generally paid by employers and employees, and usually based on earnings. Those are really the uh, public collection methods that uh, that are available. Again, for those who just joined, uh, welcome to the session. It's nice to not see you, but see your names listed anyways. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Uh, and again, I invite you to uh, ask questions as we go along, um, either by chat or if you have a microphone, uh, you can ask the question, and I will stop and, and take the question. Again, what we're doing here is uh, this is a um, review session where I have picked out a s selection of slides that I think summarize the stuff we covered in the in the sessions back in December. Okay. From there, we moved on to equity of financing and use, and we talked about how we measure equity. Uh, and we uh, use the example of uh, the Gini coefficient um, and how we can use that model of constructing a Gini coefficient to measure various forms of equity in, uh, in health or in health care. Uh, and we looked at different measures of equity, both in the financing uh, and in the health. 
and in the use of healthcare services, right? And in all three of those, you might think about uh, how equitable is a system uh, and what does it mean if certain parts of the system are uh, inequitable in terms of, of uh, health or health access. Just to give you an example, in terms of health, obviously we would um, like the people to have better health rather than worse health, uh, and so we might see some inequality. Uh, wealthier people might have better health and, and less wealthy people worse health, and that's something that we might wish the system to try and address. Now, we might also see inequality in access to healthcare services, whereby, uh, for example, we might see the opposite, whereby low-income people actually use more healthcare services and higher-income people uh, use fewer. Uh, and one can think about that potentially as a good thing. Um, I mean, it's never good if you have to use a lot of services, but one might think about that as addressing the first issue about inequalities in health, because uh, lower-income people are requiring the use of more services. Even better would be to find a way that improve their health so they don't have to use services. But when you're thinking about these measures of equity, I think we need to uh, keep some of that in mind. And I think the final thing we talked about in that first set of sessions was, do we need to think a little bit about how we determine the basket of services offered by national health services, right? Uh, and this applies equally, I suppose, to private insurers, but the problem, I think, is more acute uh, in national health services where the budget constraint tends to be tighter because um, they're constantly looking for money to uh, fund the healthcare system, and of course they have lots of other priorities as well. And, you know, uh, we touch on some of these things later on in the course, but issues that one would need to think about uh, here is are issues such as, do we cover uh, all kinds of services that are offered in a certain setting, uh, or do we focus on the kinds of services, um, instead of focusing on certain services, let's say uh, doctor's uh, services, do we focus instead on particular healthcare problems or health problems that we wish to address? And we recognize uh, that, in fact, the treatment of those problems may evolve over time, right? That we used to do it one way, uh, and uh, that might have been very intensive in, in the hospital until we covered that. But now we do it a different way. It might be outpatient surgery, or perhaps it's evolved into a treatment that only requires uh, prescription medication. So as these things evolve, the same underlying health problem may require a different set of treatments, and you would like a healthcare system to be flexible in doing that, uh, and you would like the way that you set it up uh, your system that is not only flexible in allowing you to finance new alternatives, but that it always also moves the system along in the appropriate way, and so that if there are better and maybe less costly and ideally better and less costly ways of financing, uh, I mean, sorry, of providing a service, that um, we move in that direction as a system and perhaps push providers away from older, uh, more costly, uh, potentially less effective ways of doing so. Okay. It's more fun when you guys talk. I wish you were all here. Okay. We moved on to uh, the demand for medical care uh, in the second set of lectures. And I'll remind you again what the goals that were for the key issues were in that session. We talked about theory, talked about the demand, and we explored the role of insurance and demand for medical care. Um, we talked about moral hazard. We talked about some evidence in the RAND health insurance experiment, and we talked in a discussion about policy and user charges in the healthcare system. Um, I said this was not going to be a technical review session, but I did add in one graph that I think you might remember, and that was the one that, uh, this combines two graphs actually from the lecture notes, the first showing, I won't review how we did it, but uh, showing the construction of the demand for medical care, and remember what this curve shows uh, is on the x-axis, it shows the quantity of medical care used, and on the y-axis, it shows the price uh, for that medical care, okay? Uh, and in the first instance, this is in the absence of any insurance, and uh, like most goods in economics, we think about the demand uh, increasing as the price goes down, okay? And we talked quite a bit about whether or not that's realistic in healthcare, and we uh, discussed that potentially there are some kinds of services where uh, the price may not have much of an effect 
on the demand. And we called those kinds of services inelastic services, inelastic meaning that there was uh, very small responses to the price in, in what they uh, demand in terms of medical care. And other services might be more elastic, uh, which then is the opposite, which is a, uh, quite a bit more responsive to price. And as price goes up, up or down, you may see larger changes uh, in medical care. And so don't think about medical care as one good uh, with the same kind of response, demand response, depending on one good. Of course, that's not uh, the service. We have a, a chat question, so let me just stop because it's nice to take a question. Is the service that is inelastic uh, or the demand that is inelastic? It is the demand uh, for the service that is inelastic uh, or elastic, at least in terms of the uh, graph for the demand for medical care. So it's demand we're talking about here. And therefore, we're talking about the response that the patients or uh, individuals have to the price of that service. Okay, so just to give a clear example, you may have um, two services, one, uh, two types of medical care. One has to do with uh, treatment for uh, heart attack and the other has to do uh, for treatment for a common infection, okay? And in the one case, uh, you might think that patients uh, require treatment for heart attack and are not that responsive. Uh, hopefully, they're responsive after the services, but uh, they're not that response, uh, responsive to changes in price once they require that service, um, whereas for a regular infection, it might be the case that people uh, can make a choice between um, seeking treatment or not seeking treatment, and the price might have um, quite a bit of an effect on, on what they do, okay? In both those cases, the supply side may or may not be responsive to prices. We can talk about that separately, but here we're talking about the demand, okay? So um, we then moved from a world with no insurance to a world with insurance, and we said that the way we think about insurance on uh, a graph like this with a demand for medical care is uh, the simplest way to think about it is about coinsurance rate. And we thought about a coinsurance rate. So coinsurance is for a given service, there's a price, and you have insurance that covers some part of that service and that you have to pay some other part of that service. And the part that you pay um, is the coinsured part, so you're paying uh, that. And we said in this graph that I have up here, A, on the y-axis, the A, P1, A represents the coinsurance rate. And so if the price is P1, what you have to pay out of pocket is A times P1. And so A is going to be a number between 0, which means um, your part is nothing, to 1, which means your part is all of it. Okay, so if it's 0, uh, 0 times P1 means that at a price of P1, you pay 0. And if it's 1, that means that at a price of P1 times 1, you pay the whole thing, and anything in between, okay? And the way this graph works, then, is it says, well, for a particular uh, type of medical care, if the price is actually P1, uh, the patient doesn't pay P1. He or she has insurance, and the insurance covers um, 1 minus A, and then, therefore, the patient pays A times P1, okay? And uh, in that case, uh, our demand curve shows us that actually at a price AP1, the patient doesn't demand uh, what I'm labeling here as MC1, uh, but rather more, and um, quite a bit more. And the way we find out how much more, even though it's not quite labeled on this graph, is you go along AP1 uh, all the way over to the old demand curve and see what you would demand at a price of AP1. And the way we can construct the insurance demand curve with insurance is to say for every price, um, the true demand when they're insured is actually uh, shown by the demand that would occur if they paid A times that price because that's what they're actually going to pay. And when you do that, you can say that the uh, point on the demand curve that relates to point P1 is in fact the point on the demand on the old demand curve without insurance that is shown by A times P1. Um, it would be nice if this point, and 
draw that in real time for you. But if you go back to your notes, you will see that there. And again, you will see from this graph that we have in the PowerPoint presentation that at P1, instead of stopping on the old demand curve at MC1, if you see those first two points, what happens at P1 is it goes further out to construct the demand curve with insurance, and it goes out to the point where AP1, the lower price, when they're insured, uh, hits the old demand curve, all right? And in that way, we can construct the demand curve with insurance, all right? Now, I see some, uh, here we go. So, question, why do the curves have the same intersect on the x-axis? Good, that's a good question. So let me uh, actually switch to the next uh, slide, which notes, uh, first note is exactly this question. The demand curve does not shift, it rotates on the x-axis, why? So let's go back to the curve and see why. It rotates on the x-axis because of the way we construct the demand curve with insurance instead of with no insurance. Remember that uh, we construct it by taking the price, uh, multiplying that price times the coinsurance rate, which is um, the amount the person has to pay, and seeing where uh, with that new price, the lower price, which is what the person actually has to pay, uh, they demand on the old demand curve given the new coinsurance rate. Okay, so suppose that they are fully insured, right? They pay nothing. Therefore, their coinsurance is uh, zero. And um, in that case, they do, the price of zero has a point on the demand curve. That point is where the demand curve intersects the X axis, the medical care axis. And if price is zero, I can't point at it, but uh, maybe I can do something. Can you guys see this if I do that? No, it's not, not that effective. Anyways, okay, so then I won't continue. No is the answer, so I won't do that. At a price of zero, the uh, demand for medical care is where the old demand curve hits the x-axis. What is the price with insurance? All right, so I am told that I should be able to do this. Can you see this? I'm thinking yes. All right. So at P0, this point here, uh, what is the, uh, at, not P0, so our price of zero, what is the demand? The price of zero, the demand is going to be where the demand curve uh, intersects with the price of zero, which is the second little line that I just drew, the little circle that I just drew. Now, uh, suppose that you have um, insurance now, and you pay zero, how does uh, your demand change with and without insurance? Well, it doesn't change. The price was zero, that's what you demanded, and after insurance, you will demand the same thing. So that is the one price that pre and post insurance, you're going to demand the same thing. Right? So there's no change in that particular point on the demand curve. Every other point where you uh, have to pay some, there will be a different uh, point on the new demand curve, which rotates out from the old demand curve, okay? So it rotates out this way, okay, uh, with insurance, but it does not shift out because if the price is zero, the old price and the new price are the same. The second thing to note, the lower the coinsurance rate, the less paid out of pocket, uh, that means, the steeper the demand curve, all right? Why is that? Again, let's go back right, to this. The lower the coinsurance rate, the less paid out of pocket, the steeper the demand curve. The reason that happens is, remember, the demand curve is shifting out to reflect how much more the person wants with the lower price. The lower the coinsurance rate, the less they have to pay, so AP1 keeps going down and down and down. If you draw a lower and lower AP1, 
on the old demand curve, you will see that the demand more and more. <clears throat> Therefore, when you draw the curve with and without insurance, it gets steeper the less people have to pay out of pocket. That's the mathematical reason for it, but the intuition is the less of the price they have to face themselves, the more they're prepared uh, to consume, and uh, the less responsive they're going to be to changes in prices. Which leads us to point three here. The effect of the coinsurance is going to depend on the price elasticity of demand. Right? So not only uh, will they be less responsive when they have to pay less of the price, but if you think about the original demand curve, they will be less responsive if their initial demand curve is indeed more elastic. So these two features, right, one, how much the coinsurance is, the smaller it is, the, more, the less responsive they're going to be, and two, um, the less responsive the initial demand curve, obviously, the less of the effect of insurance are going to affect how much different demand is with and without insurance. Okay? And the fourth, any insurance program then that makes the demand curve more inelastic, right, cushioning uh, the consumer uh, from the effect of a price change, uh, right, yeah, that's what any insurance program, sorry, is going to do, right? It makes the demand curve more inelastic, and so it is cushioning the consumer from the effect of a price change. Okay? Now, with all of that in mind, we talked about uh, moral hazard, and we defined moral hazard as the rational response to economic incentives brought about by the elasticity uh, of demand to the price of care, right? And it basically talks about what we just talked about in that slide, right? Which is, you will see an increased use of services when the pooling of risks or the having the existence of insurance uh, leads to a decline in the cost of those services. That was the moral hazard effect that we talked about. <clears throat> okay. The last thing we talked about in this session um, was the dead weight loss from insurance. I'm not going to go through all of the graphs we did on this back in December, but uh, the concept, just to keep in your mind, the concept is uh, derived from the definition, which is the difference between the resource cost of healthcare uh, used under insurance and the benefit received from these services. Okay? Just to go back to the slide for, uh, with the graph one more time, when you move from uh, the amount consumed under price P1 to the amount consumed under price AP1, okay, you use more services, clearly. This comes at a cost. And the increased cost, right, even if you pay less for those services, the increased cost is at the old price, P1. The doctor or the hospital, whoever's providing the service, receives the full cost. It's just that you don't pay it. So there's an increased cost associated with the insurance. And the increased benefit may not be as large as the increased cost. Why is that? Well, part of it is because the way we measure benefit in, health, uh, in, in economics is by using the area under the demand curve. I don't really want to get into too much about this uh, at the same time. But we assume that the benefit from each additional unit that you are consuming uh, is less than the previous unit because... Um, because the price has gone down, you're, you will, you're willing to pay, you're only willing to consume that unit if the price is lower, right? You're willing to consume fewer units if the price was higher, uh, and then you're willing to consume more units if the price is lower. And so your surplus from the additional consumption is less for additional units than it was for the initial units. So it may be the case for dead weight loss uh, to occur that the resource cost of healthcare used under insurance um, is uh, greater than the benefits received. Okay, and we talked about that, just as a concept to keep in your mind. We're not going to uh, require calculations of this kind of stuff in the exam. Welcome to those of you who just joined. We are going through, once again, <clears throat> a few slides from the course as a review session to help trigger in your mind uh, the stuff that we covered back in December. And if you have a question as I go along, I would welcome your questions. Uh, please either text them uh, in the chat uh, in the chat feature, or you can turn on your microphone if you have a microphone and ask them. I haven't heard any sounds so far, so I assume that people are not doing that. If you are and it's not working, then I guess we revert to the chat feature. Okay. After the demand for care, we move to prices, insurance, and consumer behavior. And the key issues that we covered here were, were uh, the theory of insurance 
and risk, uncertainty, and, and uh, insurance. We talked about average selection. We talked about some evidence. Uh, we talked about private insurance in the European Union and uh, a little bit of evidence from mm -hmm. Obamacare and elsewhere. And then in policy, we talked about average selection in private markets and universal insurance. Okay. okay. And we started with a model of uh, when we would buy insurance. And again, I'm not going to take you through uh, all that model for a second time. But the uh, concept here was that we would buy insurance if the expected utility from insurance, uh, and remember what utility is, your expected happiness in a world where you are insured is higher, or at least as high, with insurance as it is without. And we actually did put this into uh, an equation form, where EU in this case is not the European Union, for those of you who are following uh, European politics, uh, rather it is expected utility. And uh, it is the sum of two different parts. And in this, these two parts, you can go back to your original notes for all the definitions. This is just a little review. Uh, it's the sum of two parts. The first part is your utility in one state of the world, and that state of the world is when you don't get sick, right? And we defined uh, the probability of being sick as P, and therefore the state of the world where you don't get sick as 1 minus P. And your utility in that state was your income minus um, the uh, premiums you have to pay for insurance, plus another part, which is your utility in the state where you're sick. And in that case, your utility comes from your utility from your income minus your premiums minus a loss plus the payout from insurance. Again, if you go back to the notes, you will see all of this defined uh, in the slides. And we asked, when will a person buy insurance? Well, we said the person, the person will buy insurance if it actually makes sense to do that which means that their expected utility with insurance is greater than the expected utility with no insurance. Okay? Again, I put these equations here to jog your memory and to uh, help you uh, think through the concepts, right? Not because what we're going to be asking here is some manipulation of equations. That's not what we're going to be doing. Okay. So, from there, we turned to the problem of adverse selection in insurance markets, and we defined adverse selection as the fact that insured, arising from the idea that uh, insured individuals know more about their risk level than does an insurer, uh, and that that might cause those most likely to have adverse outcomes to select insurance, the insurers to lose money if they offer insurance. Okay? And uh, we noted that given that, Right? You need to sell insurance to both um, high-risk people and low-risk people for insurance to work. The two things that insurance, well, there's two things that insurance likes, uh, would like to achieve. One it really has to achieve, and the other it often likes to achieve. The thing it has to achieve is it has to pool risk across people, right? So across types of people. Insurance does not work if everybody uh, uses the same, high, the same amount of services. In that case, there's nothing insured about it. Everybody is going to use the same insurance and the pool of funds, uh, the amount of services, and the pool of funds to pay for that is just what people pay for the insurance. For it to actually work, it has to be that only a few people are going to use insurance and that a whole bunch of people are going to pay for the insurance but not be sick and therefore cross-subsidize the people who do use it. Okay? The second thing that most insurance packages, especially if they're run by a government, like to do is cross-subsidize from wealthier to less wealthy people, but uh, it doesn't have to do that, and lots of private insurance does not do that. What it has to do is cross-subsidize the cross-risk. The problem with adverse selection is that uh, if people know more about their risk than the insurer, it could be, without some interventions, that only the people who are likely to be heavy users of the insurance buy it, and in that case, um, the insurance company will lose money because it's not cross-subsidizing, or the insurance company will have to pay charge a very high price, and if you charge a very high price because only sick people uh, seem to be buying it, well, then less sick people are going to be even less interested in buying, right, because uh, the price is not um, seen reasonable to them given what their uh, expected payout, uh, expected need is going to be, okay? So these problems were the kinds of problems that we talked about in the existence of a world with adverse selection. And what does that mean? It means we have a potential market failure where only sick people buy insurance, right? And in a world where plans charge average prices, generous plans uh, may disproportionately attract sicker people, and more moderate plans 
might attract relatively healthier ones. Okay. This ends up with pricing differences that are um, actually above and beyond the difference in price that would reflect the benefits because they also have to account for the people who actually buy it. All right? So it's going to cost more than the differences in generosity uh, would require. And you might end up with a market failure where uh, you only have some uh, very costly plants that are attracting only very sick people and can actually not be sustained. Okay. I'm talking a lot. I hope that uh, it's coming across okay. Um, it is uh, <clears throat> fine for you to stop and say, I don't get that, I don't remember that, and uh, take a break and, and think about it. Uh, I'm getting some comments saying, all good. Okay, on we go. On we go. So, two fundamental difficulties with after selection. One, um, we might have people who choose to be in less generous plans so they can avoid paying for the higher cost of very sick people. And two, plans will have incentives to distort their offerings to attract the healthy and repel the sick. Okay? So, we have to deal with this in some way because those are not things we actually want. How do we deal with it? Well, this goes back to uh, the stuff we talked about in the very first set of slides. Um, there's basically three sets of ways that people deal with it, or companies and uh, governments deal with it. One is through mandates, right? If you're worried about only certain people buying insurance, you can pass a mandate that says everybody has to buy insurance. You can't not buy insurance. And that avoids this problem of uh, healthy young people opting out of insurance. And that, in Obamacare, is exactly an example of that, where they want people in. The second way, very common way, is to say, look, uh, we're not giving you the choice uh, between buying and not buying, and we're not even giving you the choice between plans. We have a single plan, like the National uh, Health Service here in the UK, where I'm speaking from today, and everybody's in it, healthy and sick. And so uh, we have no average selection. Right? The third way that we spend a little bit of time talking about, uh, and that a lot of countries use in combination with mandates uh, is through risk adjustment. And what risk adjustment does is, it's okay, we're going to have different plans out there, and they're going to charge different prices, and people are going to choose which plan, or we, you know, we put into a plan. And it may be that we have some selection going on, where some plans have healthier people and some plans have less healthy people, and it may be that firms purposely try to attract healthier or less healthy people, usually healthier, but what we're going to do as a government is we're going to let you do that, and then we are going to adjust how much money we give you to help provide this insurance by looking at the people in your plan and saying, look, if you have all sick people, we're going to have to give you more money. Uh, and if you manage to get all healthy people, I don't know how that happened, but it doesn't really matter how it happened, we're going to take some money away because you don't need as much. Right? And so governments can risk adjust across the risk or the health in expected uh, health in the different plants uh, to deal with these average selection problems. And you see all three of those um, in, uh, in action. Okay. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. We have 15 minutes and tons of stuff uh, to get through. <clears throat> so I will just scan through some of this stuff and then, and, then, uh, and then offer some concluding remarks. Not too fast. but We moved to private financing and private delivery, next. And we uh, made a point of saying, look, private financing doesn't always mean the same thing, right? There are four, at least four, uh, ways of categorizing what private financing, just like you can categorize the public system, you can categorize the, the private system. And we've broken into four different kinds. Substantial, complementary uh, in terms of services, complementary in terms of user charges, and supplementary. And um, here, the differences, which are listed here on the slide, basically talk about the way in which the private coverage interacts with the public coverage. Does it completely replace the public coverage and you have to choose? Well, that would be uh, substituted, and Germany would be an example of that. Does it complement the public coverage with services that are not available in the public sector, uh, insured in the public sector, and so it's, they're insured in the private sector? That would be complementary services. Does it complement the public sector by providing coverage for costs that are not covered by the public sector? And that's the third category. Or does it supplement the public sector 
by allowing you to buy coverage for the same things that are in the public sector, but that you might want to get faster or higher quality or different types of providers, uh, while never leaving the public sector. You're still insured by the public sector. And we have all four of those potentially in play. And some of the problems and benefits we talked about refer more, I think, to the bottom three categories than the top one. The top one is a, is a, uh, has some problems as well, but, but most of the talk, stuff we talked about relates more to the bottom three. Right. We talked about why we might worry about this, right? Concerns about equity would be one, and we had a discussion about that. And we talked about concerns about financing, right? Fiscal feedbacks or externalities where the existence and type of private system can affect the performance and the costs of the public system. We need to worry about that, okay? And we, I'm not going to list all these off, but we spent some time talking about the possible negative externalities and then also the possible positive externalities that private financing uh, has, and we reviewed some evidence, and I uh, suggest that you go back and take a look at the evidence as well, um, basically to lay out here that there is a debate here, right? Um, my view is the evidence falls more heavily in favor of the negative externalities than the possible benefits, uh, but there's evidence uh, available on this, and that um, it does suggest that, in fact, the private sector uh, has effects on the public sector in ways that we might want to think about. Okay. We also talked about private delivery. If the financing side is how do we um, the the private uh, versus public insurance and the funding of uh, care, the delivery, the public versus private delivery is uh, is it a public uh, provider that's providing services or is it private provider that's providing services and we made a distinction between different kinds of private delivery, right? There are private not-for-profits, there are private for-profits but small, and there are private large corporate deliverers of care, and I think it matters which one of them they are. It doesn't make a lot of sense in my view to just categorize everything as private delivery. And uh, um, when you're thinking about, well, is private good or bad, it made some sense, I suggested back in December, to think about actually how are they making the money? Right. How they're making the money on the private side will tell you a bit about whether we think this is a good or bad thing. Different people might have different views, uh, but in general, right, it's hard to argue that if they're making money from things like specialization or economies of scale or even better management, I mean, those three, uh, we might think of those as good things. If they're making money, uh, going right down to the bottom of the slide, by sacrificing quality in ways that we can't see, we might think that's a bad thing, right? If they're making money by selecting only the healthy patients, we may think that's good or bad. I mean, I think probably the public system will think it's bad, but, uh, but you know, it's not necessarily uh, a horrible thing, but we need to recognize that that's the way they're making the money. They have the easy patients and the least costly patients. Um, and if they're making the money by getting themselves out of uh, labor agreements, um, you know, getting, going around unions or other... Uh, high price mechanisms that, that rack up the price, well, you know, that's an issue that people have very different uh, views on, and, um, you know, let's recognize that it does change the cost structure, uh, so it depends how you feel about unions and the benefits of higher wages relative to uh, the costs, which are higher costs. Is, right? So let's try to understand how they're making the money before we um, pay them all with the same brush stroke. We talked about um, physician reimbursement. And we went over some key issues here. We talked about um, models of reimbursement, supply side, demand side, cost sharing, we touched on supplier induced demand, and we talked quite a bit about how we should pay doctors and hospitals. Um, I will, we went over the various models in play for paying doctors and uh, which are used and, and what blends of these models, you'll recall the big ones are fee for service, where we pay people um, based on what they do. Capitation, where we pay them a fixed amount per patient. Salary, which we pay them a salary. Blended models that combine uh, capitation and fee-for-service, or salary and fee-for-service, all three. And then potentially some pay-for-performance on top of that, where we say, look, there are certain outcomes that we are interested in um, that we're going to, if you achieve those outcomes, whether they be patient health, uh, they don't usually tend to be... Um, number of people you see, that's something we probably don't actually pay performance on that, but patient health or, or um, 
the maintenance of particular diseases for patients, uh, we may want to pay a bonus for all that. And we see examples of all of that out there, right? And we talked about the pros and cons of each of these models and the incentives inherent, the economic incentives inherent in each of these models. And so uh, go back and, and review that to make sure you have, um, this, is, this is your core business, right? So I think you probably have a pretty good sense of that stuff. But uh, what I want you to do is think about the underlying economics and how that might move stuff one way or another. We talked about the fact that, you know, um, we actually have the ability to impose cost sharing on both the supply side and the demand side, right? Demand side cost sharing means making the patient pay for part of care. And the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the hour uh, refers to that. But supply side cost sharing is saying, look, the way we pay physicians or hospitals um, imposes more or less risk on the physicians and hospitals, and that is a form of cost sharing too, right? So um, if, for example, a doctor is capitated so that they see the fixed payment for a patient, if uh, they do more and more for that patient, well, they are bearing the cost of doing that because they've already been paid for that patient. Uh, whereas if it's fee for service, they're not, right? Because they'll get paid more if they do more. Um, so we can think about models of demand side and models of supply side cost sharing and when one might be more appropriate to use uh, over another. And in fact, there's no reason why only one can be used. We can use both at various times and in various ways. We talked a bit about trends in hospital financing, right? We noted that many jurisdictions are on their way uh, away from global budgeting, right, uh, or per diem budgets, and towards an activity-based uh, type of payment, whether those be uh, DRGs uh, or uh, some other model that looks like a DRG uh, that basically moves to paying hospitals for what they actually do um, uh, or for particular uh, episodes um, of, uh, of illness uh, that people present with. Okay? And we talked about some of the concerns around this. Uh, one of the benefits, clearly, is, is the transparency. If you're paying hospitals for what they're doing and not just some budget that has no uh, real meaning associated with it, the possible concerns given that everybody's moving there, is to remember that expenditures, right, are price times quantity. And uh, if we're paying a fixed price uh, for a certain amount of quantity, uh, we may be driving up expenditures, right? Um, if, indeed, uh, the price uh, keeps going up over time, that will also drive up expenditures. And there's reason to believe that in particular kinds of treatment, we had a, you know, a reasonable a debate around this that got even uh, more heated when we talked about some examples that, uh, from articles that, that we, we had in class. Uh, if it's the case that technology actually should be driving down prices, but you are still paying the higher price, then you're going to be spending a lot more, and in fact, uh, we may be doing a lot more of different kinds of activities, and so activity-based funding might end up driving prices up, uh, expenditure up, sorry, driving expenditure up um, almost never seems to drive expenditure down. Um, we talked about agency versus inducement. Uh, when we talk about doctors doing more for patients, it is always important to keep in mind that, in fact, we hope that doctors will do for patients what patients would want done if they had all the same information that the doctor has and all the same knowledge that the doctor has. Patients don't, and so we trust doctors to make that decision and do what's uh, right for patients. Um, and act on their behalf. We contrast that with inducement, uh, which is when doctors do things for patients that they know are not in the best interest of patients. Right? And then if the patient had the same information, they would choose not to do. Right? So to say that doctors uh, control healthcare, uh, the amount of healthcare that a patient uh, uses does not uh, imply a bad thing necessarily. Right? That's what we want doctors to do, use their agency. What we, can, we are concerned about is when they use that agency to induce care uh, that's more uh, for their benefit than it is for the benefit of the patient. Right. Um, does this happen? Well, the articles we talked about by Tulgawanda suggested that quite a bit of it happens. We had a debate about it. Um, sorry, I just saw now uh, Theodore asked, what's SID, supplier-induced demand? Does that make sense, given what I just talked about in terms of inducement? So SID is supplier-induced demand. Um, just to go back to that. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, whether it's proper agency or inducement, 
supplier-induced demand um, will obviously depend on the circumstance, uh, and we had a, a heated discussion about this, I recall. Some people think some of that's going on. Others think that all the care we're giving patients is, is appropriate care. Obviously, from, from uh, sector to sector, you'll have differing views, and, and, uh, and uh, we need to think about this, right? Uh, certainly, there are many writers who believe there's lots of extra care going on, um, and then lots of groups that think that all this extra care is actually great stuff and that it's actually helping patients, right? Trying to understand where we are is going to be important. Um, we talked a bit about uh, technological change and healthcare, and uh, in that discussion, we talked about models of technology, uh, technology adoption. Uh, is technology worth it? And then we had some discussion about uh, when to say no uh, in terms of providing care and discussion of quality, cost, and innovation. Right? And we had a model of insurance and the bias towards cost and increasing technological change. I'm not going to put up the model again. Uh, I want you to take the intuition away from that model. And the intuition is basically this, that we might worry that in a, with a lot of insurance, there is less of an incentive to innovate in cost-reducing ways because patients don't pay for that. Right? If we assume that we could innovate in uh, ways that increase costs that have larger benefits, and then we could also choose ways that... Uh, have some benefits but decrease costs, and that in the ones that decrease costs, the benefits are not as big as the ones that increase costs, well, the system is set up to uh, push towards those kinds of technological innovations that have big benefits and also come with big costs. You know, it would be lovely to see, um, uh, it would be lovely to see innovations that had big benefits and reduced costs. Those are few and far between, they happen, but they're not as, uh, as common as the ones that have small benefits and reduced costs or have large benefits, but they're really a lot more expensive, okay? And that's the intuition uh, here is that the more insurance we have, the more reason uh, patients are going to want the ones that have big benefits because they don't have to worry about the costs, okay? And that's basically what, uh, what we have here in this intuition slide. We talked very briefly about methods of economic evaluation, right? How do we decide which technologies to adopt? Uh, what I tried to stress was that uh, this has to happen. Right? We have to figure out what we uh, do want to do and not do. And it would be good to make sure that we're actually considering alternatives, right? Not to just say this new treatment. We had examples of it uh, from your own areas, actually. This new treatment is amazing, right? The question to ask really is, uh, um, great, it's amazing. But uh, we should know both the consequences, which hopefully are amazing, and the costs, right? How much more does it cost to deliver these amazing results? And we need to be able to evaluate that against an alternative choice, right? So, okay, the new treatment is amazing, but what is the uh, alternative treatment? Is it way worse uh, and also costly? Or is it a little bit worse and way less expensive, right? Being able to compare these two uh, allows us to do a proper economic evaluation of what's happening, okay? Uh, we had some, some more articles on our hospital costs and when doctors might want to say no, and uh, if you want to refresh your memory, very readable articles by Sabuamba, you can go and uh, read on that stuff. The last topic we covered, uh, since we're just passing five o'clock, was health versus healthcare. And the key issues here is we tried to sketch a model of health production. We uh, tried to examine the implications of such a model over time. We looked at some evidence. Um, some of you presented some of that evidence in our final presentations. And we had a little bit of a policy discussion about resource allocation on health versus health care. Okay. Um, I think what I will do, well, the Grossman model was the sort of workhorse model in this, in this area. And a very simple um, way to think about the Grossman model is that it's a model that takes a bunch of inputs, right, healthcare, diet, exercise, environment, et cetera, and those inputs end up generating the production of health stock over time, and that the output that we're looking for here is healthy days, right? Do we have healthy days in which to work, uh, to enjoy leisure, 
uh, and to even produce more healthy days. All of those are things you can do with healthy days. What you can't do with healthy days uh, doesn't count as a healthy day are those days that you're too sick to do any of that stuff and you completely lose. Right? That model, I think, is nice to have as a background and you can go back and review the notes. I think the key issue that I would, uh, sort of the four key aspects that I would try to remember is that on the consumer side, they want health, not medical care. Right? Medical care is just an input to that health. They might express themselves as wanting medical care, but what they're actually looking for is health. They're not just producing health. They produce it as well, and producing it requires time and money. Right? That health is not a single period thing. It lasts for uh, a number of periods, but not forever. So it has both a stock and a flow. And that it's both a consumption good and an investment good. Consumption uh, in the sense that people feel better when they're healthy, and investment in the sense that it produces healthy days to use for both work and leisure. Okay. And then the final thing we spend some time talking about is the issue of socioeconomic status in health, right? And we know that there is a very long standing debate over the relationship between socioeconomic status, SES, and health, and that doesn't really matter how you define socioeconomic status, whether you define it by income or class or occupation or whatever, uh, people with higher socioeconomic status enjoy better health, right? And uh, the debate is not really about that. There's two parts of the debate. The first is why, and the second is, um, is it absolute socioeconomic status that matters, right? So how much money is it, or uh, how much higher is your class, or is it relative? How much money do you have relative to other people? Uh, and what's your measure of, uh, of class or occupation relative to other people, right? And there's an ongoing debate about this, and we talked about it quite a bit. And I told you that economists, um, at least, come down on, on it on, on particularly, mainly on one side, right? And that side is um, a hedge, which is that, you know, we definitely believe that uh, there are negative effects of income inequality in a number of domains. Uh, what we are having a harder time finding evidence of is the relationship between that income inequality and health, even though there is a very strong relationship between income and health. Okay, so given the time, what are some final thoughts? Right? And my final thoughts will be uh, directed at the exam, uh, not at the material. So the first is, uh, I'm sure you're loving being students again, so try to enjoy it and don't uh, um, get too worked up about the fact that along with being a student uh, comes evaluation, right? These are going to be questions that are general and open-ended, right? Not specific and detail-oriented. Obviously, it will be helpful to have uh, a command of uh, the concepts and the evidence behind those concepts, and some details are often useful in trying to make general and open-ended points. But the questions themselves are not going to ask you, you know, what about this model did that or what did the evidence say on this page about this issue? There are going to be open-ended questions that will allow you to bring in knowledge you have about the models and uh, the evidence, right? You will have some choice. So there's a topic that you just don't get. Uh, you will probably be able to avoid it, right? Uh, and so uh, what we're going to offer you are six questions that you can choose to. And so uh, some choice um, to, to focus on things that you, have, you feel are strengths and avoid those things you think are weaknesses. It is not my opinion, given uh, the time you have and the number of questions that you are going to face, that time is going to be a big constraint here. So I think you can approach these questions um, with care and lay out an argument uh, before you write your answer, not worried about, oh my, I have to answer all this stuff in two hours. Two questions. That's all you have to do in two, uh, two hours, an hour per question. So I think you will have plenty of time. And then finally, you know, it's going to be fine. You're an incredibly smart group. Uh, and the material, uh, as I presented it back in December, uh, my sense was that you really did grasp the concepts, and I am quite confident you'll be able to apply those concepts in this context. Okay, so um, good luck, and I uh, hope that this has been a useful review. Uh, I believe, yes, it is a closed book exam. Um, there you go. Conf confirmation from Stephanie. You cannot bring anything into the exam except for your brain and uh, uh, some writing stuff. Hold on, the texts are coming in now, faster than I can read them. Okay, one second.
Um, I haven't put up any sample questions. So, and both the questions here are about uh, sample questions. So, let me uh, tell you what kinds of questions they will be, right, without talking about any particular question. So let's pick a topic. Let's pick topic of adverse selection, right? The questions would, the kind of question would be, you know, what are, for example, what are the key concerns uh, around adverse selection in healthcare systems and how do systems deal with those concerns, right? That's the kind of level of, um, of question that we're talking about, right? Um, what are the options uh, for paying doctors? And what are the consequences of these different options? And what should systems be aware of as they think about these kinds of options, right? Questions at that level, not questions that are, you know, in the model, if you shift the demand curve from this to that, uh, what's going to happen, okay? You guys catching that? Anything else? Okay. In that case, thank you to those of you who joined. For those of you who want to listen to it later, I hope it makes sense uh, when listened to later. Um, good luck. I hope that our paths will cross. For those of you who emailed me at uh, LSE or Sion's Po, uh, please remember that I am not there. And if you want to reach me, um, please contact me at INSEAD, uh, mark.stabile at INSEAD.edu. I have not been checking the other emails, and I checked it just recently to see that some of you had uh, asked some questions. So I hope that your questions were all answered, and I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Best of luck, and with that, I'm going to sign off.